This is the Tom Hartman Program. Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. Surveys show, writes David Callahan in today's New York Times. Surveys show that most Americans feel that their voice does not count in public life, and they want to reduce the influence of the wealthy. But today's big philanthropy, and by big philanthropy, he's talking about this, this crop of, of billionaires that has been created by the Reagan tax cuts. And, you know, over the last 30 years, we've seen this just massive explosion of billionaires uh, and, and how they are now taking over the functions of government, of, of democratic governance, of we the people. He says, but today's big philanthropy is moving us in the opposite direction at a time when inequality stands at record levels. And that record levels part, that should be shocking. That should be, you know, every, every person in America should know that we are at a point where the rich compared to the, to the poor, the rich compared to the middle class, the rich compared to the rest of us, are richer than they've ever been at any time in American history, with the single exception of 1929. And they're actually richer than they were in 1929, just before the Great Crash that led to the Great Depression. But just very slightly, I mean, we just surpassed 1929 about two years ago. So here we are. There's a brilliant piece. It's the, uh, the David Callahan's piece. It's titled, As Government Retrenches, Philanthropy Booms. He starts out saying, last year, as Kalazoo, Michigan struggled with the budget deficit and other economic woes, two local philanthropists stepped forward, pledging $70 million to improve the city's fortunes. Earlier in 2016, a group of foundations put up even more money to help another troubled city, Flint, Michigan, recover from the contamination of its water supply. And a few years before that, the foundations helped to rescue Detroit from bankruptcy. These episodes, coming after years of cuts in state aid to Michigan cities, may offer a glimpse of America's future. Yes. If you want, you know, it's, it's like uh, when I saw the clip on television this morning of Eric Schmidt, the, the CEO of, uh, I think it's Alphabet is what it's called now, the, the parent company of Google, um, sucking up to Donald Trump. He, it was like the, the Trump uh, uh, cabinet meetings. And, and he was, and he, you know, he was just basically sucking up to Donald Trump. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, the billionaires know, and Eric Schmidt's one of them, they, they know that they, they have their money and their power in large part because of things like copyright laws, trademark laws, you know, rules and regulations that allow them to do what they do and low taxes. And this is what keeps them billionaires. And, and, and the president of the United States has some influence over that. And the president of the United States himself, an alleged billionaire. The uh, author of this piece, David Callahan, goes on to say, their influence is growing in tandem with their largesse, shifting power away from democratic institutions. Look in any area, the arts, education, science, health, urban development, and you will find a growing array of don wealthy donors giving record Sums. Philanthropists have helped fund thousands of charter schools across the country, creating a parallel education system in many cities. The most ambitious urban parks in decades are being financed with, built with financing from billionaires. Some of the boldest research to attack diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's is funded by philanthropy. Private funders led by the Gates Foundation play a growing role in promoting global health and development. This is among the Forbes 400. These are the richest 400 people in the United States with a combined net worth of $2.4 trillion, 400 people, with a wealth of $2.4 trillion, are numerous billionaires who plan to give away much of their wealth. All told, over $20 trillion is likely to find its way into to philanthropy in the next century. Now, I get it that there are some people saying, well, here's another one, in New York City, now, now people are starting to push back, by the way. Uh, in New York City, a proposed island park in the Hudson River financed by the billionaire Barry Diller and his wife Diane von Furstenberg has faced strong legal challenges that underscore a growing uneasiness about the role of private money in public spaces. Other big urban park projects have raised similar concerns, and in Baltimore, alarm bells went off when philanthropists funded an aerial surveillance project by the city's police department. Yes, the philanthropists are saying, you know, we need drones in the sky because eventually those people are going to come out with their pitch, pitchforks and their tar, you know, buckets of hot tar to pour on us and feathers. Oh, my God, the feathers. I'm exaggerating, but 
the point is that if we had not dropped that top tax rate, as Ronald Reagan did, from 74% down to 25%, that's what Reagan did. It has slowly eked back up to 39%. Over the screams, the howls, the pathetic cries of multimillionaire K Street lobbyist Grover Norquist and his billionaire funders and buddies. But if we had not dropped that top tax rate below 50%, and 50% is the threshold, by the way, that you see all over the world. There's, I mean, literally dozens of examples of this in other countries where when the top tax rate goes above 50%, the economy stabilizes and the society stabilizes. When it's below 50%, you have growing inequality and growing instability. It's not good for society. It's not good for culture. It's not good for democracy. And what has happened is, as a result of Reagan dropping that top tax rate from 74%, and it, 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 up until 1967, I think it was, it had been 91%. And then uh, LBJ, maybe it was 64, whatever year it was, it was in the, in the late 60s, um, when, when LBJ dropped that top tax rate from 91% down to 67%, um, or 74%, excuse me, he was doing it based on proposals that John Kennedy had run for president on, in which, and I've played the clip many, many times for you, I don't probably need to play it again for you to hear it, but in the debates with Nixon, John Kennedy said, I want tax changes that are going to increase revenue to the federal government by closing loopholes. We're going to lower the top tax rate because nobody pays that top tax rate, but we are going to close the loopholes. And he specified which loopholes even, you know, business deductions. Um, you know, and and he, he went through a list and he said, we're going to spend more on public education. We're going to spend more on infrastructure. We're going to build this country back or build it up. At that point, it wasn't, we weren't sliding back in 1960. We were moving forward like, you know, nobody's business. I mean, just gangbusters. And he said, you know, Mr. Nixon constantly misstates my position, but I, you know, I just wanted to be on the record. This is where I stand. Uh, he stood for raising taxes on the rich, Jack Kennedy. And that's what, you know, Lyndon Johnson did when he dropped that top tax rate down, down to 74%. It actually increased government revenue. And it wasn't this bounce effect. I mean, you know, when Reagan cut the top tax rate, it, it took two years before the government uh, revenues recovered. Same thing when George W. Bush dropped the tax, top tax rate. It took a year or two before, the, before, the, you know, re before things kind of restabilized. And they restabilized in a new kind of economy where the billionaires were getting richer and richer and richer and government functions were being cut and cut and cut and cut because there was less revenue coming into the federal government and into the states for that matter because a lot of the states base their state taxes on federal income taxes. In, in most states, the, the income tax that you pay is a percentage of your federal tax. So if the federal tax goes down, the state tax goes down. Federal tax goes up, state tax goes up. So what happened was that as government started to get hollowed out, the billionaires realizing, you know, this could lead to social chaos. This could lead to a revolt. This could lead to a populist revolution. This could lead to politicians standing up there and saying, those banksters are killers. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to bring them down. As Donald Trump said in the election, and so did Bernie Sanders, by the way. We are going to take down the banksters. We're going to break up the big banks. Yes, Trump campaigned on that. Obviously, it's not happening. I mean, the, the head of Goldman Sachs is now, you know, the head of his team of economic advisors. Our secretary treasury came from Goldman Sachs, Steve Mnuchin. You know, obviously, Trump was just lying to the rubes on tax policy, on, on pretty much everything. I'm going to give you better health care than you've got with Obamacare, and it'll cost less money, and you'll have more coverage. Eh, it's a lie. I will absolutely protect your Social Security, your Medicare, and your Medicare. Eh, it was a lie. We're going to stop involvement in foreign wars, especially that stupid Iraq war. It was a lie. But in any case, as government has receded, and the billionaires have taken over, the billionaires have had to throw a little chump change our way, our way being, you know, the, the, the infrastructure of the United States. And now Trump really wants to double down on that. He wants to say, 
You know those highways, that, that interstate highway system that Dwight Eisenhower and the Democrats built? We want to sell that off to other billionaires so that they can put toll booths on it. Our internet that our federal government invented, and we want to sell that off to the billionaires so they can put toll booths on it, basically. So that, you know, the way that you get your internet will be the way you get your cable right now. You get a package. Oh, you want, you know, you want access to news sites? Well, that's an extra $10 a month. You want access to streaming video? That's $20 a month. You want your TomHartman.com website to load fast? Oh, you're going to have to pay your ISP a little extra money. Oh, you've got a website that is like anti-Comcast? Well, you know, that's just not even going to show up. This is the direction we're going. And in the meantime, the billionaires are coming in saying, don't worry about the public parks, we'll take care of you. Don't worry about the public schools, we'll fund charter schools. Don't worry about health. Don't worry, you know, you, we don't need, you guys don't need Medicare and Medicaid. We will pay for some small clinics here and there. Don't worry about research. The federal government has been the leader in research for 100 years. Don't worry about that. Government doesn't need to do that anymore. We'll do it with our priority. And when we do that research, we'll figure out a way to get even richer as a result of it. And when we own those toll, when we own the interstate highway system, we'll figure out a way to get even richer as a result of it. And when we own all the parking spaces in Chicago, well, that's already done. We'll figure out a way to get even richer off it. And when, and not just Chicago, I mean, you know, next stop, every, every city in America. Privatize everything. Profitize everything. Corporatize everything. This is their agenda until there's nothing left of democracy. Until, until the idea of we the people is just a, a leaf in the wind. This is the direction that they want to take us. And their number one toady is not Donald Trump. It's Mike Pence. I'll tell you about that. Great, stick around.